Hello, welcome to the expert's perspective from the Great Debates meeting being held in San Diego, California. I'm fortunate to have uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Alice Shaw, who is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a physician treating lung cancer patients at the Massachusetts General Hospital, here to share her perspectives here with me. Alice, great to have you. Thanks, Kevin. So today we had uh, this discussion. We began with the updates on some of the important topics, and we moved on to some uh, debates with key topics, and we had some discussions about the challenging issues in oncology. So the day full of uh, meetings, conversations about various aspects of uh, you know, emerging issues in lung cancer. So two issues dominate today in lung cancer. One is how best to use these novel agents in a group of patients with oncogen-addicted non-small cell lung cancer. And second is how to use immunotherapy in the context today, not only in this group of patients, but also in the other group of patients. Given your uh, contribution expertise in ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer, why don't we start off with, with ALK-positive non-small cell lung cancer? And by the way, you gave a great lecture today on the state of art of you know, targeted therapies 2.0 today, and I want to thank you for that first. So let's start off with ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer. So what is happening? Can you give us a capsule summary? Sure. So uh, this field has moved really quickly, as you know, from uh, the initial discovery of ALK as an oncogenic driver in 2007 now to having nine ALK inhibitors that are in clinical development. Um, we provided an overview this morning of the data on crizotinib, which is the first generation ALK inhibitor. Um, and there's lots and lots of trial data now supporting the use of crizotinib as first line therapy for our patients with metastatic ALK rearranged lung cancer and also for second line and beyond. Um, the data is very clear that crizotinib is superior to standard chemotherapy, either platinum combination chemotherapy or single agent chemotherapy. And I think none of that's a surprise because we already knew mm -hmm. from the single arm studies that crizotinib's efficacy is very high. In general, the response rate with crizotinib is in the 60 to 70 percent range, and median progression-free survival with crizotinib is in the 8 to 11 month range. So, you know, very highly efficacious um, therapy for these ALK positive patients. I think what's been particularly exciting um, the last several years is um, our understanding of resistance to crizotinib, um, and coupled with that, actually having therapies um, that we can now use um, for patients when crizotinib has stopped working. So at this meeting, we've reviewed the data on some of the next generation inhibitors like seritinib, which is approved in this country, electinib and brigatinib, both of which have FDA breakthrough therapy designation, and some of the other ones as well that are earlier in development. And the exciting thing is that these next generation inhibitors, which are more potent than crizotinib and can overcome many of the crizotinib resistance mutations, mm -hmm. many of them have very promising data in single arm trials where the efficacy of these next generation inhibitors is about 50 to 60 percent, median progression free survival in the seven to 11 month range as well. So it's, it's very, I would say, impressive that a mm -hmm. patient who has failed on the first generation inhibitor can basically have another response very similar to the first generation inhibitor now to a next generation inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're going to see is patients who are receiving now sequential therapy with not just one or two, but sometimes even three ALK inhibitors depending on their resistance mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, it's an exciting time. We have all of these options for ALK positive patients. Um, the question that we discussed a lot at this meeting really is how best to sequence mm -hmm. ALK inhibitors. And that was one of the topics for our debate today that Jonathan Goldman um, and Karen Reckamp did, um, discussing, you know, should we be using crizotinib first line? And I would say, yes, we should, based on profile 1014 data. But really, the debate is, well, what about the next generation inhibitors? Because they do work so well mm -hmm. in crizotinib resistance. And we do have some emerging data, single arm data, though, um, on these next generation inhibitors in the crizotinib naive setting. And in that setting, the next generation inhibitors are also showing really impressive activity. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interest in moving right. these next generation inhibitors to the first line setting. But we really won't know how mm -hmm. to address this until we see the results of um, at least one of the randomized trials that is ongoing, that's the ALEC study that mm -hmm. we discussed as well today, which is a first-line study for newly diagnosed ALK-positive patients who will receive either electinib as their first therapy or crizotinib. Mm -hmm. And here the endpoint is going to be progression-free survival. 
And what we hope to see is that by using a next generation inhibitor like electinib first, we might actually see a quite a prolonged median progression-free survival. We know that from sequential crizotinib followed by a next generation inhibitor, we can get roughly on the order of 20 months, you know, mm -hmm. between eight to 11 months with crizotinib followed by another seven to mm -hmm. 10 months with the next generation inhibitor. So what many of us are hoping that we might see is that when we move the next generation inhibitor first line, we might get that very prolonged upfront mm -hmm. PFS. It's, it's really fascinating and only time would tell what order we have to sequence, but mm -hmm. today in practice, you know, during the discussion, you brought up this issue that uh, you would treat patients initially with crisotinib. Unless somebody has brain metastasis, you prefer to use serotonib because of a better penetration. And uh, in fact, electinib has even better penetration That's to CNS. Right. So all these things would dictate how we choose right. therapy as we go along. Truly fascinating, particularly remarkable, considering the fact that we never knew about the existence of this group until seven, eight years That's ago. That's correct, yeah, know, and to have all of these options is really, really impressive. And moving on, in the interest of time, uh, we, had, uh, wonder, we had a wonderful discussion about the EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. As you know, the two subset analyses from the Lux Lung mm -hmm. 3 and Lux Lung 6 showed a fatinib produced improved overall survival compared to chemotherapy, and we had the discussion, what should we use in the mm -hmm. frontline setting, mm -hmm. exon 19 deletion subset. And uh, Jack West argued, uh, for the use of fatinib, citing that uh, data from Lux Lung 3 and Lux Lung 6. And uh, we had further discussion about uh, you know, using other EGFR-TK inhibitors uh, uh, based on uh, you know, the meta-analysis and others published. And you told us that uh, you prefer to use a fatinib in the exon 19 uh, deletion population, the right. frontline I mean, setting. In the EGFR space as well, there's been so much progress, and mm -hmm. I think the great news is that there are these potentially great options. So we did focus a lot on which, um, you know, should we be using first generation EGFR inhibitors like gefitinib and erlotinib versus, say, a fatinib in mm -hmm. our patients with exon 19. And I think that survival data from uh, the Lux Lung trials is, is quite compelling. And so mm -hmm. I think many of us um, who treat a lot of patients with exon 19 deletion, many of these patients, you know, they're, they can be young and healthy and robust, and they really want to have every possible therapy that, you know, that's going to help mm -hmm. them. And so I think given the survival data um, that was presented on and published now for Lux Lung, the Lux Lung trials, I think many of us have moved toward using mm -hmm. a fatinib. My hesitation with using a fatinib really just has to do with its tolerability. It is a very tough drug for mm -hmm. many of our patients to handle, um, primarily because of the GI side effects and the skin side effects. Um, and also, um, I would say the mucositis is, is particularly tough um, in terms of quality of life. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, in terms of survival, the survival right. analysis, I think that's been quite compelling. In all fairness, the fatinib has not been compared, or at least it is also not out yet, comparing a fatinib with gefitinib or a lotinib. There is a study, Lux Lung 7, if I'm not mistaken, that will compare, the, that, that has been completed, yes. uh, comparing gefitinib with the fatinib, so we will know about this. But at least it is fair to say that today, our patients the EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer of choices, erlotinib, afatinib, now gefitinib, yep. that just been approved in, in the U.S. Uh, for use. So I think we have more and also, yeah, and also erlotinib bevacizumab. We never right. really talked the, about that as Right, well. those data from Japan that's are very right. interesting. Phase two data it's, right. it needs to be confirmed, but certainly that's something uh, worth exploring. But more importantly, almost all these patients progress, and when they progress, it seemed like now at least in half of those patients we have some excellent option with um, AZD-9291 and uh, CO uh, Clovis-1686 mm -hmm. or Rosilitinib. Any thoughts on uh, on that? Yeah, so I think it's, it's a really exciting time for EGFR. Um, it really has been, it's felt like many years before mm -hmm. we had an option for patients when they failed their first generation EGFR inhibitor. And really just in the last several years now, we've seen the development of these very potent um, irreversible T790M specific inhibitors, what we're calling the third generation inhibitors. And the data has now been presented and published for both um, AZD 9291 as well as rosalutinib, formerly known as CO1686. And for both of these drugs, they have really, pr really promising mm -hmm. efficacy in those patients who have developed resistance to first generation EGFR inhibitors due to T790M. Mm -hmm. I think the point you made is that that's important is that it's over half, probably over half of patients, 50 to 60 percent of patients who relapse on first-generation EGFR inhibitors due to T790M. So there's a 
large population mm -hmm. of patients who are going to benefit from these new EGFR inhibitors. The response rate is in the 60% range. Median progression-free survival, at least with the AZD compound, was over nine months. So mm -hmm. these drugs, again, just like the next generation ALK inhibitors, right. these third generation EGFR inhibitors are able to reinduce mm -hmm. responses in, in most of these patients who are relapsing due to T790M. Right, Alice, the important message for us uh, to give it, say to the audience is, uh, when when patients r who are on EGFR mutant non who have EGFR mutant non small cell lung cancer, when they progress, it's important that we biopsy the progressing lesions to determine whether they have T790M in the tumor cells, so we can they can be placed in appropriate trials. That's exactly right. Hopefully, those things will be available. Um, I know we are running short on time, but I just want to cover in the next five minutes uh, a few issues. Uh, one of them is. Uh, these targeted drugs are very active in these patients, but at some point they do run out of options. We do use chemotherapy. Mm -hmm in this population. What about immunotherapy? Mm -hmm. What has been your experience? So um, that's a great question, and I think there's a lot of excitement um, from, uh, you know, obviously the uh, investigators, but patients as well, about the role of immunotherapies. Um, we've seen the published results now on immunotherapy PD-1 drugs like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, um, and the efficacy is, is quite impressive, and I would say in particular the duration of, of some of these responses can be very, very long. What we've seen, though, in patients who are um, never smokers or light smokers, and many of those patients do have targetable mutations mm -hmm. like ALK and EGFR, is that the response to immunotherapies when they're given on their own seems to be less than what we've seen in the overall population. And in fact, I think it was quite notable that um, at ASCO, when the uh, Checkmate study was presented, that's the second line study mm -hmm. of nivolumab versus docetaxel and non squamous, non small cell lung cancer, of course, that showed an overall PFS, and an, I'm sorry, an overall survival benefits. Mm -hmm. It was very impressive. But when you looked at the subsets... In favor of... Uh, in favor nivolumab. of nivolumab. Mm -hmm. um, but when you looked at the subsets, um, the EGFR mutation positive subset and the never smokers, there the benefits seemed to more favor That's docetaxel nice. compared to nivolumab. And I would say in my experience, our institutional experience as well as other institutions like um, Sloan Kettering have also looked at this, there does seem to be less activity of these immunotherapies in never smokers compared to the smoking population. Mm -hmm. But still, it may reflect the less mutation burden Absolutely, since many yes. of them are non-smokers. Yes. And I think with time, we'll start this out, but definitely not a contraindication, but definitely a uh, good reason to pause and not to use this new and emerging drug over uh, drugs over targeted you know, therapies target that therapies have been already well validated. That's right. yeah. yeah. And you know, I want to summarize a few other things we discussed today in the immunotherapy section. I still think that PDL1 expression biomarker is evolving and uh, a lot of confusion. Some drugs are going to be approved with the companion biomarker, I suppose. Some um, nivolumab has been approved for all comers. Right. The commercially used PDL1 is not necessarily tied to the development of all these drugs. So I think we should caution people from using these commercially available PDL1 to select patients for one or the Absolutely, other. Absolutely, I would agree with and that. And you agree with that? Yes. And I think it's really, it's going to be a very complicated mm -hmm. topic as we go along. One thing is certain, the side effects from this uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, are manageable. We have learned quite a bit. Yes. And I think we should watch for this, select patients appropriately. And uh, in the last few minutes, I just want to touch on a few areas. Locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer, we have hit a plateau. And the last study, the RTOG, 0617 study showed conventional radiation therapy, you know, chemotherapy or paclitaxel, carboplatin, conventional doses of radiation produces median overall survival of 28 months. You know, we used to see nine months before mm -hmm. with radiation alone, now things have improved. But a lot of the increase in, increase in overall survival seems to have come from post progression possibly mm -hmm. systemic therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, since majority of the relapses are systemic, I really think we should, you know, put in more efforts to come up with better systemic agents. Absolutely. In that regard, studies are ongoing with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Yep. Then our own study in RTOG looking at targeted agents and targeted patients, EGFR, mm -hmm. ALK is being done. Are you aware of any other strategies that are being done to increase No, I, but I completely outcomes. agree with you that we have to work, you know, for the patients who have yeah. resectable disease and then eventually relapse, and particularly for the patients with locally mm -hmm. advanced disease who have such a high risk of relapse that we need to incorporate all of these new therapies into their mm -hmm. regimens and we have to figure out how to do it right. Two other issues I want to talk about before we close. One is small cell lung cancer. Second is adjuvant therapy. We'll finish the non-small cell first, adjuvant therapy. 
And right now, there's a large adjuvant study currently ongoing, the Alchemist mm -hmm. study, where patients with resected non-small cell lung cancer will be screened for EGFR mutation ALK, and if they have one of these, they get standard therapy, be it just surgery or surgery followed by chemo or chemo radiation. Then they get randomized to ALK inhibitor, crisodinib or EGFR inhibitor, lotinib, in a randomized setting. And that study is up and going, and uh, I, I, we are eager to complete the study. Any thoughts on that? No, we're very excited. We have that study up, up and running as well at our institution, um, but I think it's a long study to do. You know, particularly right. the out cohort, we've got to find those right. patients, so we've got to encourage everyone to be screening and referring for that um, because it is, you know, three to five percent right. of our patients, so we've got to find those. And of course, there's going to be a long follow-up right. as well. I really want to put in a personal plea here for our community oncologists. We need your help to successfully accrue patients for this and other studies, so please do help. And uh, there is going to be an immunotherapy arm yes, as well which is great. with nivolumab, and that probably would cover it. And we plan to do genomic analysis mm -hmm. of all 8,000 patients being screened, so it's an important study, so it would be great to have your help. Mm -hmm. Finally, small cell. And in fact, we discussed uh, today about the role of radiation therapy. You know, Dr. Slotman's uh, group published this in Lancet recently, addition of radiation therapy in small cell lung cancer, extensive stage disease, mm -hmm. surprisingly improves the overall survival almost threefold, from 3%, no radiation, to 13%, two years, in group of patient extensive stage small cell lung cancer. You know, the, initially I was very skeptical. Now we have two studies. One is Dr. Slotman's study from Europe, and years ago, the Jeremic study, and both showed in extensive stage small cell lung cancer, after they finish chemotherapy, if they are doing reasonably well, they get thoracic radiation that seems to improve the outcomes. And it is a sad thing that a disease that is so systemic in nature, our chemotherapy programs haven't advanced. Any improvement we have seen, both in limited and extensive stage disease, seems to come from radiation therapy. So. These days, I've been trying to send patients to radiation oncologists to get their, you know, opinion on doing radiation therapy, uh, you know, following induction chemotherapy with four cycles. The argument they make is that most patients, about 90% of them, have residual intrathoracic mm -hmm. disease, and thoracic uh, site is a common site of, um, you know, uh, persistent disease. And uh, they feel that by doing this, they decrease the local relapse, and overall survival seems to be improved. Mm -hmm. It's hard to argue. Any That's thoughts right. on that? So we've been doing the same. I mean, uh, I think we also have found those studies uh, quite uh, impressive, and so I do also refer my patients for thoracic radiation when they've completed their chemotherapy. At ASCO this year, we also heard some nice data on immunotherapies in small cells, right. so I am pretty excited about that as an as an option for patients because, as you know, our options for small cell patients right. are so few, um, and if we can get even a proportion of small cell pa patients who might benefit from immunotherapies, right. th that would be an amazing step forward. We are not going to get ALK or easier for no. inhibition type of stories, but then people are now looking at the you know, PARP inhibitors using yep. genomic instability and immunotherapy is certainly an option. Alice, once again, it's always it's always a pleasure to talk Thank to you. you. I learned so much when I listened to your lectures, Thank you so and much. I'm sure our colleagues uh, have learned quite a bit uh, uh, from from our discussion. And I appreciate all your help. Terrific work. Keep up your uh, wonderful work, and we are grateful to you. And our patients are very grateful to you for all your wonderful Thank work. You. And I want to thank you, the audience, for participating in this activity, and I hope uh, you benefited from this uh, exchange. Please do let us know what you think, and please send us your comments. We thank you very much.